I'm Barbara Wadlinger, and um, I emailed your teachers this morning, and I work at the Geophysical Institute for the ACMP program. Today we have Professor Dr. Atkinson, and he is an atmospheric scientist, and he works at the International Arctic Research Center. He was born in northern Alberta, and his entire academic career has focused on Arctic studies. He, he had, his bachelor's degree dealt with frozen ground, his master's degree with satellite remote sensing in the Canadian Arctic Islands, and his PhD data was on climate issues, and also he um, did studies in the Canadian Arctic Islands. He got all three of his degrees in Ottawa, Canada. He did four years of summer research field work in the high Arctic, setting up instruments in the field and on glaciers. Also, he worked at Logistics Base in Resolute Bay, coordinating data gathering and transmission to the Arctic Division of the Meteorological Service of Canada. He also had postdoctoral appointments working on historical climate and Arctic coastal erosion and storm issues. He arrived in Fairbanks in the summer of 2004, and his studies have been focusing directly on Alaska ever since. So welcome, David. Thanks, Barbara. Okay, today we're going to talk about instruments, about weather instruments, and I'm going to show you some examples of a lot of different types of weather instruments, and we'll talk a little bit about how they work as well. Um, we've got, there are lots of different things that we measure in the atmosphere, but some of the ones that you're probably most familiar with are our temperature, um, the wind speed, uh, humidity, which is how much water there is in the air, um, atmospheric pressure, so that's the high and low pressure systems, uh, precipitation, so how much it rains or snows, uh, and then we'll look at a, another type of instrument that lets us gather this type of information up in the atmosphere. So I'll start with, with temperature. Um, all weather instruments depend on, they, they have to measure some sort of, of change that they undergo uh, in response to what you're measuring. So in other words, that sounds a little complex, but, but just think about temperature. When something, when things get warmer or colder, they expand or contract. So they get bigger or smaller. So when something gets warmer, it gets a little bigger, and when something gets colder, it gets a little smaller. And we can use this to give us measurements of temperature. And the one that you're probably very familiar with are basic thermometers. So like this. So I'm sure everyone has seen these. They're up everywhere. And the way the basic thermometer works is it has inside some liquid. In this case, this thermometer has alcohol in it. It's colored red, so we can see it. And there's a, a, a big amount of it down here at the bottom. And then there's a very thin tube that runs all the way up. And the tube has little marks on it that tell us how many degrees, so how many degrees Fahrenheit. And when we warm the tube up, so if I pinch the tube, it gets the liquid, the alcohol, starts to get warmer. When it gets warm, it starts to expand. It wants to take up more space. So the only place it can go is farther up the tube. So we can see where the top of the, of the alcohol goes and measure it and get a measurement of temperature along the scale. So we're using the fact that alcohol expands when it gets warm and contracts when it gets cold to measure temperature. This thermometer actually is special in that not only does it measure the temperature right now, but another thing that's of a lot of interest for people who study climate to know is how hot did it get that day and how cold did it get that day. So this is a, a minimum thermometer. So not only does it measure temperature, but it shows us what the lowest temperature of the day was. And it does that by, there's a little tiny stick inside the tube, inside the alcohol. 
and when the alcohol gets down to its lowest point, it pushes the little stick down. But then, when the alcohol starts to rise again, the stick stays in place. So we can look the next morning and see how cold it got that night by where the stick is. And then you just tip it like I was doing to move the stick back up. So that's a minimum thermometer. The other type of thermometer you're probably familiar with has silver stuff in it, and that's liquid mercury. So that's not used as much now because mercury is, um, it's kind of a dangerous substance. So we don't, we try not to use it. Um, the reason it's in this thermometer is this is another special type of thermometer called a maximum thermometer. And in this case, as it gets warmer, the, the mercury expands and it starts moving up the tube. But then when it gets colder, the mercury starts to contract, gets smaller, back and runs back down into this little holder place for it, but it leaves the, the rest of the mercury up where it was at the top. And then you can look at it later on in the day and see how warm it got. So that's a maximum thermometer. So knowing the maximum and minimum temperatures is, is an important thing. So expansion and contraction of, of liquid is one way to measure thermometer, and it's how people have done it for a, a very long time. Recently, in the last few decades or so, um, new ways to measure temperature have been developed. And a lot of these depend on electricity. So people discovered that if you take two different types of metals and attach them to each other, that they can conduct electricity, just a little tiny bit. But if you have an instrument that's sensitive enough to measure that voltage, you can figure out what the temperature is because the amount of electricity they generate varies according to how warm they are. Um, another way to do it is to take two pieces of metal, put them together, and then put a small voltage through it. And that voltage will change depending on the temperature. And here's an example of one of those. So this long thing here is a, a snow temperature probe. So if you take it and stick it into a snowbank, there's a, one of these uh, wire thermometers at the end of it, and you can measure the temperature down inside the snow. So you can measure it at different depths down into the snow until you hit the ground. And then the temperature is recorded. It's, it's a voltage that this machine translates into, into a temperature reading. So that's an example of a newer way to do it based on electricity. And this thing is interesting as well. If you were to take this into a snowbank on a day when it's, say, minus 40 in the air, and measure the temperature at the bottom of a snowbank, say two or three feet deep, thick, you would find that the temperature would be much warmer inside the snowbank. Snow is a very good insulator. Okay, so I think we'll, we'll do wind next. So everybody is probably familiar with a device called an anemometer for measuring wind. So, and this works because when wind blows, it, it exerts a force, it pushes. And you can feel this. When the wind is blowing very strong, you can feel it pushing on you. Whoops, my mic. You can feel it pushing on you, can't you? So the wind is able to push things. So this instrument uses that idea. So the wind pushes on the cups. The faster the wind blows, the harder it pushes on the cups and the faster it spins around. So and then this device, this anemometer, has a little tiny magnetic switch. And then there's a little piece of metal in here. And each time the piece of metal goes past the magnet, it counts. And then it simply adds up how many counts it made over a minute, and that's the wind speed. So the more counts, the faster the wind speed. And then this has little 
hookups where a wire goes, and this goes into a, a machine like this, like I showed you earlier for the temperature, and it will record, it turns the electrical counts into wind speed. Along the same line is a, a wind vane, because you usually want to know where the wind is blowing from, so the wind vane will tell you that, and it's got the same sort of setup. So it has a little electrical device in here that knows which way it's pointing. It sends the signal through wires, and then the, wa the machine at the other end is able to turn that into a direction, north, south, whatever the wind is blowing from. There are other ways to, to measure wind. Um, wind, um, the speed of wind, as, as air moves faster, the speed of sound can change a little bit. I know that sounds a little strange, but um, we can use that principle with a different type of anemometer. So this device here is also a wind measuring device. But this uses, it doesn't use the force of the wind, it doesn't use the strength of the wind's ability to push, this one, this machine sends little sound signals between these, these posts and the wind changes the speed that the sound moves between the, the, uh, the little points. And then there is, so, uh, there's a little computer in here that is able to figure out from the, sp the change in the sound how fast the wind is going and what direction it's coming from. But this has no moving parts. So as you can see, this, this has little moving parts and sometimes that can be a problem because if you know bearings from a car or from a generator or something, uh, bearings can wear out and then it, it gets stiff and stops moving. This doesn't have any bearings to wear out. Um, sometimes the work that I do uh, means that I have to to do some interesting things that, that not too many other people have done before, which is part of the fun of doing science sometimes. Um, one of the things that we have is a, a weather station on top of Mount McKinley, on top of the mountain. And the winds up there are very, very strong. They'll easily get up to about 200 miles an hour. Um, so a weather instrument like this simply is broken. The cups are broken off. And it also is icy up there, so a weather instrument like this one, which you can't see, like this, ice forms on these little sensors and it, it stops working. So you need a special type of sensor up there. So I had to think up a way to do it that didn't involve some of those other methods. So I had a company build this thing. So this is also a wind sensor. But it's just, as you can see, it's just a ball. But it's able to, the wind blows on it, and the wind can blow from any direction. And then there are little sensors inside that figure out how hard it pushed from each direction. And then it tells me what direction the wind was from and how hard it was blowing. And it doesn't have to be left and right. It can also tell me if the wind was blowing from up or from below, which is important in a mountain area because the wind is often blowing um, up or down as well as left or right. So that's kind of a neat thing. So it's fun to, to try to think up solutions to problems. Another very important weather parameter, weather uh, piece of information to learn about the weather is uh, pressure, so the atmospheric pressure. So the air all around us pushes down on us, and we don't notice it because we, we live here. We've, uh, we're adapted to live on the surface of the planet, so we don't feel the force of the air pushing on us. But the, the force of the air, um, the, the air pressure changes, um, and these changes are part of uh, changes in the weather. So it's, it's very useful to us to know what the changes in pressure are so that we can figure out what the changes in weather are doing. 
So we have devices like this, um, and this is called a barometer, and this device measures pressure. And it works by inside there is a little metal container that's closed, but the container is made of very thin metal. So as the air pressure increases or decreases, it pulls or pushes on the on the air on the little container. And then there is a little little tiny wires hooked up to it that are hooked up to this needle. So when the the little metal container gets squeezed or gets a little bigger, it moves through the wires and changes the position of the needle and we can see what the pressure is. Here's a very small one of the same thing. Um, another interesting thing about pressure <coughs> is that the higher you go, the less the pressure is. So you can actually use pressure if you're climbing a mountain you can use a device like this. You can use a barometer, not to tell you the pressure, but to tell you how high you go, because pressure decreases with height. So that's called an altimeter. OK, here's another instrument. This one is used to measure humidity in the air, so how much moisture is in the air. And that's important as well, because if there's a lot of moisture in the air, it means that clouds and rain and snow are probably more likely than if the air is really dry. So that's another important thing that uh, people who study climate and weather want to know. This one operates here in the back. All it is is a little string in the back, and this string absorbs moisture. And the more moisture it absorbs, the looser it gets. It gets, it stretches out a little bit. And that's hooked up to this little pulley and this little tiny lever and, and, uh, and pulley setup that hooks it into this, hooks it into the needle. So as that little string stretches and gets smaller, depending on how much water it's absorbing, the needle changes position. So in, in many cases, a lot of weather instruments are based on fairly simple um, properties of materials. They expand, they contract when they get warm or cold, they absorb moisture and they get bigger or smaller. So we can use these properties to, to gain a lot of information about, about the weather. Here's another way to gather information about how much uh, humidity is in the, in the air. This is called a psychrometer, and it has two thermometers, one regular thermometer, and then another thermometer with a, a little sock around the bottom of it. And the way this thing works is you, you take water and make the sock wet, and the other one is just stays as it is, and you spin it around. So it's actually called a sling psychrometer. And the idea is that it takes heat away. It takes a certain amount of heat to make the water evaporate. And the more moisture in the air, the less will evaporate off of this. So we can tell, we can read the differences between the two thermometers, and then there's a little chart on here, and we can use that and determine how much moisture there is in the air. So, okay, just in the last, we're going for half hour, right? So just in the last few minutes, I'm going to show you, well, I'll show you two things. Okay, here's another example of a thermometer. So this is one of the more modern electrical ones I was talking about. So here are its wires, and it gets hooked up to one of these little computers to read it. Now, if you're going to set it up at a weather station, you would never just take this and sort of stick it on the weather station like this. This thing would be put inside here. So this thing 
as funny as it looks, is called a, a radiation shield. And the idea is, if we put this out on a pole to measure the air temperature, and the sun starts shining on it, the sun will heat this up. And then we're no longer measuring the air temperature, we're measuring how hot this little thing is. So whenever you measure, when you, whenever you want to measure air temperature, you can't let the sun shine on the thermometer. Otherwise, it's heating the thermometer up. So you have to put it inside something like this. So this is white, which reflects the sunlight, and it's got holes in it, which lets the air go through it. So that means that the sun is not heating it up, and the air is getting through it so that you can actually measure the air temperature. So the other thing I want to show you is this. Something else that's very important for weather and climate is to know what the temperature is, what the winds are, what the pressure is, um, not just at the surface, but up in the atmosphere as well. So we need to somehow get weather instruments up into the atmosphere. This is how the, the weather service does it. This thing is called a radio sonde, and it's attached to a balloon. And twice a day, all over the world, these things are launched from stations that, um, whose job it is to do nothing but launch these, these balloons. So they fill up a balloon, they tie this thing to it, and they come out and they let it go. And these will go very high. They'll go about 20 miles up into the atmosphere, and then the balloon eventually pops, and then they fall back down. And these things contain, in very small electronic form, a temperature sensor, pressure sensor. They can sense how much moisture is in the air. And the winds are determined by, by watching it from the ground and seeing how far it moves off so if, if the thing, if it rises straight up, you know the wind is zero all the way up. But it never does that, so it's always being moved. And that, and watching it and seeing how far it moves, how quickly it moves, what direction it moves, that tells you what the winds are at different heights up in the atmosphere. This thing has a little battery, and it also has a transmitter. So this is a transmitter. So it, it's sending information about the temperature, about the humidity, back down to a receiver all the while it's going up. So, and these are, there aren't as many stations that do this, uh, gather this type of information as there are ones at the surface. But there are lots of them and all over the world, twice a day, these are gathered. Welcome back everyone. Uh, we're gonna take your questions. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna ask one question first. It's from Shishmaref. And the students there wanted to know how they get accurate wind speed readings with weather balloons using that equipment. When the balloons are launched, there are two ways to do it. The, the way that it used to be done is they would, would track the balloon with uh, something called a theodolite. So they would watch it through this little tiny telescope. And the telescope had, has very precise um, uh, marks on it that show exactly how high and exactly how, how far, you know, how far around they were going. So they could use that and then figure out using a little bit of math, a little bit of a trigonometry, um, and figure out exactly where the balloon was. So that's, that's how it was done in the past. And so now, more recently, they use, um, they can figure out where it's going by, by the transmissions being sent from the, from the, from the um, radio sonde. So they can track its position using um, sort of radio telemetry, very precise radio telemetry with it. Someone from the National Weather Service, um, when they were there, um, said that the storms were getting fewer but worse conditions. Are we seeing different results than tropical areas? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, that kind of ties into the, the whole idea of, of climate change. Um, you know, the idea that the weather is changing. So what about the weather is changing? Well, temperature changes storms change? Are they more frequent? Are they more intense? Um, <clears throat> the one, uh, one, a lot of people, I think, in, in general, have, 
have an idea in their mind that the climate change means sort of a, a uniform change everywhere. You know, if the temperature is rising, then everywhere it's rising. The one, one important thing about climate change is changes do not happen the same all over the place. So uh, just for the, the temperature idea, Alaska and the Yukon are really warming up, but there are some areas of the Arctic that over the last 40 years, in fact, haven't even warmed at all. Um, and the same is true with storms. Um, although the, our storms might be changing, in the tropics they might not necessarily be changing. Um, I'm not sure of details of, of all tropical places, although there were a couple of research papers that came out not too long ago that did talk about the fact that hurricanes both in the Atlantic and in the Pacific, where they're called typhoons, uh, but it's the same storm, it's the same type of storm, just different names. Uh, both seem to be increasing in intensity. Uh, I, I wasn't sure if they were getting more or fewer of them, but, but I know both, both papers seem to suggest that they are increasing in intensity. Um, although another important thing to remember with climate change when we talk about changing temperature and things getting warmer and storms getting more frequent is that, or, or sea ice, you know, sea ice retreating, is that there's a lot of variability from one year to the next, as I'm sure you will know. Um, and, and this is the case with tropical storms as well. So for example, 2004, 2005, there were a lot of hurricanes in the southeastern U.S. But this past year, there were very, very few. It was a very quiet year. So after 2004 and 2005, people were probably thinking, oh, they're, we're just getting more and more storms all the time. But then suddenly this year, almost nothing. So um, a change in variability is also part of, of climate change, both with temperature, with sea ice, and with storms. Where did you get your idea for that ball? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. Well, I, I, I started to think um, there are so many problems with trying to measure the wind up on the mountain. And some of them are, are the ones that I described. First of all, the wind is very strong. So I, I basically made a list of all the things that basically are not allowed. So I know that this this is not allowed up there because these just break off. And this is not allowed because these little things get covered and then it no longer works. So I thought, okay, what, what does a, the wind sensor have to be? So I made up a list. It can't have moving parts or things that'll break off. It can't have sensors. Um, because the wind is so strong, it often picks up things and some of the sensors have come down from the mountains smashed because things have hit them. Big pieces of ice or even rocks have hit them. So it has to be able to withstand damage. It has to be able to withstand ice. It has to be small enough that somebody can carry it. There are wind sensors that are designed for hurricane areas, um, but they're great big things. They're big and they're, they're very heavy. So those are no good because to get a wind sensor up to the mountain, someone has to carry it on their back. A mountain climber has to carry it on their back. So it can't be too big and it can't be too heavy. Um, another problem we had was uh, one wind sensor we sent up two years ago had a little computer in it. The computer froze and stopped working. So it can't have a computer in it either. So I sat down and thought, well, how can we, how can we do this so that it's all of these, these conditions are, are satisfied. And I thought, well, maybe just a ball. If the wind can blow on a ball, the ball is, seems pretty, pretty hard to damage if it's made out of, out of aluminum. And if it's not too big, it's not too heavy, and it can be carried. So, and I, I worked with the company. I had an initial idea, and then I started working with the company that built this thing. And they said, well, we could do it like this, and maybe you want to change that. So it was... Uh, an initial idea that I shared with the company and then they, we sort of worked on it together. But the actual 
ball idea. I think I got that from, I saw a sensor that goes into the ocean and it had a similar type of arrangement and I thought maybe this can be used for the mountain. So that's kind of where it came about. Questions if you could mute your mic. How long have I had it? I got it just uh, about two months ago. It's brand new. So, and it's the only one around. Do you get the boxes back from the balloon? Ah, that's a good question. <laughs> In fact, on the box it says mailing instructions. And here, notice to finder. It says, this instrument is the property of the United States government, NOAA, National Weather Service. Um, some people, um, they put this message on here because some people get scared when they find these things. They don't, they see this, and unless you know what it is, it's hard to, to know what it is. They say, oh, what, you know, is this some scary thing that's being, you know, sent by by an enemy or maybe it came from spaceships, they dropped it or, you know, they don't know what it is. So, so some people get quite upset when they find these things. So they, the weather service is careful to put a message on them saying it's, it's just to measure weather. Um, it says this weather instrument is known as a radio sun, was released to measure temperature, pressure and humidity and so on. If found in the United States, mail at any post office or hand to your local rural carrier. Um, so yes, these things do make it back to Earth. And in fact, I've found several of them in the, in the high Arctic. Uh, they've been smashed, or, or I've found ones that have been there for years and years and years. Um, but just uh, a few months ago, the, um, one of the professors in my department found one in a tree, just as he was driving along a road here in Fairbanks. So it, it hadn't gotten very far up into the air and it had come down and, and the newer ones do have a little parachute that they'll deploy. So we saw some red in the tree and went over and climbed out of his car and climbed into the tree and got it and was quite proud that he'd found this thing. But, so you can find them, yes. Did it ever hit anybody on the head? I don't know actually. I've, I've never heard um, if they if they have or if they haven't, I don't know. How big are the balloons? <laughs> How big are the balloons? The balloons are actually really big. Um, they start out. Um, they they don't fill them right up, because another thing that happens when you remember I said with this little tiny pressure sensor that you can put in your pocket and carry up the side of a mountain to measure your altitude. You can measure your altitude because pressure decreases as you go up. Well, when you, you take, if you were to take a balloon and fill up a balloon to a certain size, and then if you were to take that balloon in an airplane, you would find that the balloon would get bigger because the amount of air inside the balloon stays the same and it pushes against the walls of the balloon and the air outside the balloon pushes back on the walls of the balloon. Well, if you take it up and there's less air outside, the air on the inside of the balloon is able to push harder. Or it, it, it's, it's, there's now less pushing back and it gets bigger. So the radioson balloon is filled up uh, partially and it's released. And as it rises, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the balloons end up about 300 feet across before they pop. So they get very big. So if you can imagine, basically, a football field. If, so that's, that's how big around they are. They get quite big, and then they pop. I'm surprised people don't see them more often, but... What's the name of the silver ball? Oh, um, it, it's a three-axis thrust anemometer. <laughs> It's a pretty dry name, but uh, it, it's not so much a name as a description of what it does. So it measures wind in three dimensions, sort of left, right, front, back, and up, down, and it measures by thrust, by something pushing. So one of the Ken Stank students wants to know what the favorite part of your work is. Actually, I like um, telling people about science a lot because. Uh, 
many people have lots of questions and it can be hard to to learn things about it so I like doing this and I go into the schools in Fairbanks a lot too. I go into the high school and I go into the elementary schools where my kids are in school and I talk to them about weather. I also talk to them about the stars because I have a big telescope and I used to do a lot of work in astronomy so I talk about stars and the weather um, but I think that's a fun thing. I also like the fact that the the work that I do um, is able to help people fairly directly so work at the coast, coastal erosion and coastal storms are a big problem, of course, because you live right in that area. Um, so I'm glad that the work I can do can help people try to cope with, with these things a little bit better. So that's, that's a nice thing for me. I like working in what's called uh, applied research, where the work that you do can go do something for people very quickly. He'd also like to know, um, a student over there in Shishmaref, would like to know um, what your current work focus is. Most of my focus now is with storms and coastal erosion, uh, both in Alaska. It, most of it's focusing on the west coast of Alaska, um, but I'm also involved with another uh, big project that deals with the same type of problems and questions in the whole circumpolar Arctic, so over in Russia, and in Canada, there's also very severe erosion problems um, throughout northern Russia and in northern Canada in the village of Taktiaktak. They have some severe erosion problems. Um, <clears throat> and of course, uh, you know, there are companies that want to build oil wells and so on, and they, they have to think about this problem as well. Are you going to be famous for that silver ball? No. No, it's, it's, um, it, it's pretty expensive and uh, so, so very few, for example, it wouldn't be something that you would install on the school. Um, uh, and it's, it's really pretty specialized. You know, if someone's going to, if someone wants to measure wind, in most cases, uh, the regular type of, of anemometer, of wind sensor will work. Uh, this one is for very specialized situations where you've got strong winds and a lot of icing and things flying around um, and very remote places where people don't visit very often and you can't even get a helicopter up there and that kind of thing. So it's the fact that it just won't be used by that many people will mean that not many people will know about it. So uh, no, I, I don't think I'll be famous. So you won't see them sold in, in, in the store. <laughs> what is the instrument called that measures humidity? Actually, there are two. This one, the one that looks like you use at a party, is a psychrometer. And this one is a hygrometer. And meter just means to measure. So they're all meter, meter, meter. A lot of these words come from uh, Greek and Latin. So that's, that's why they don't, I mean, if, if we were, if we could suddenly name it now, we might call it a, a water meter or something like that, which would be easier on, on English speaking ears at least, but however. How long have you worked? Um well, this says with the GI, but you also work with IARC, um, that's your physical institute and international Arctic research center. And where did you work before? I came to Fairbanks and joined the uh, UAF, basically joined IARC um, in the summer of 2004. Uh, before that, I was at a place called uh, Bedford Institute of Oceanography, which is in Halifax, which is on the east coast of Canada. So quite, uh, quite a fair ways, probably. It took us uh, 20 days to drive up. We, we, we were enjoying the scenery, so we could have gone faster, I suppose. But it's about 6,000 miles. Um, and there, I was actually, even though that's in Halifax, which is not really, if you look on a map, it doesn't seem that far north. Um, we actually had sea ice forming in the harbor. Now, we didn't get lots of sea ice like you get um, you know, in Kotzebue and Norton Sound and whatnot. 
but we still had sea ice forming. So, uh, and the issues I was dealing with there were coastal erosion issues, because that's where the Canadian federal government bases its Arctic coastal research people. Um, why, I'm not sure, but that's where they were. So that's where I was working. That's where I started to work on these issues. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>